So you booted up Imperator Rome. Maybe you got it on a sale. Maybe you've had it for a while. And you're looking at this map thinking, what country do I play and where? There's a lot of things to take into consideration when you play a nation in Imperator Rome, especially if you're brand new, but even if you've been playing for a while. What government type is it? How do they work? Do they have a lot of events? What neighbors do they have? What kind of military power do they start out with? I'm going to try to summarize that information to provide you a list of noob-friendly nations to play, as well as more advanced ones for those that have already played them, or for newer players to potentially avoid. Now, I've already made a general government guide on this game going over all the government types in some detail. It's in the playlist if you want to see that, you can find it in the description. But first, of course, it's in the name of the game. Rome. This is Imperator Rome, and I will tell you Rome is probably the easiest nation to play in the entire game. If you're brand new to the game, if you like the Roman aesthetic, if you're just looking for the most flavored and in-depth nation in the game to play, then Rome, this is going to be your choice. You start out decently small, only 23 territories and only about 399 pops. Comparing that to the greater powers, if we look at Macedon, you see they have more, twice the territory, a bit more pops. Uh, Egypt has way more. Carthage is misleadingly small, but we'll talk about them later. And we have some behemoths over here to the east. Rome is so tiny compared to that, but they're so powerful. This small nation starts out with just levies, which are very simple to control compared to anything else in the game. Simplify it for newer players. Some of these surrounding little nations actually are Roman feudatories, as you see. This one right here, this one right there, they're highlighting. These are all feudatories, meaning they'll join you in wars and help you. Your enemies surrounding you are very weak. They're very easy for you to take over because as this size, you are, by yourself, feudatories aside, as powerful, roughly, as Macedon. And you have far more versatility. You have, I'd say, better finances initially, especially holding, you know, this future metropolis of Rome. You have a lot of events that will give you claims on your surrounding nations as well. You will get events that will give you claims on all of Italy, basically. Eventually letting you jump into Greece, letting you get Sardinia and Corsica, letting you go for Carthage, even going into Anatolia, and later on claims that go into Gaul. No nation gets as many free claims as Rome does in this game. If you're looking to assimilate population, no nation in the entire game gets as many events that will assist you in assimilating that population as Rome. Rome gets the most. Due to all of these free things that happen for Rome, and you even get free cities, by the way. Free cities, these things right here, which if you watch my buildings guide, you will know are pretty big money generators, and honestly, they're the best resource generators in the game too, especially if you make them into slave cities. All of this free stuff makes Rome the easiest nation to play, the strongest nation in the long run. One of the strongest at the start, despite being the smallest in its 2B weight class, the fastest developing, it is the most new player friendly as well because it starts out so simple and because you get so many things that help you out. This is the first nation to play and this is probably some of the most I'll speak about any nation. If you're brand new and you don't know what to play and you want something easy, pick Rome. And if you play everybody else, beware of Rome. Moving on to the next nation I want to talk about, I think a next obvious one to talk about could be Carthage. Carthage is almost equally fleshed out as Rome is. They have many events to help them, and like I said, they are deceptively size. And so what I mean by that is, you might think they're smaller than they are, because they just own this little strip here, little tiny bits and pieces there, little tiny pieces over here, this weird little thing, and that. But they're much bigger than they seem. This belongs to them. Look at all these feudatories and other things here. These little areas here belong to them as well. These belong to them. These can belong to them pretty easily. There's a number of them. Massilia starts as a tribal vassal and they get tons of events to allow them to integrate these things, forcefully conquer them, 
if you're going for a less centralized route, which is really easy to get into as Carthage. It keeps them really busy at the start of the game, however. They are definitely a step up in complication of playing from Rome. It's a completely different play style. They are both republics, mind you. Both of these are republics, which are, in my opinion, the easiest government types in the game to play, especially for new players, because there's not a lot of min-maxing you can do with a republic. I went over that in my government guide. And in return, there's not a lot of complication either. You'll basically be good no matter what playing either of these nations because they are republics. Carthage does have it harder. They will be attacked by Rome. But given your naval dominance and many, many events you get for bolstering your navy and your income, which if you watch my economy guide and buildings guides, you'll learn a lot about how making income works. This is easy to turn into the richest nation in the game with the events that they get. Second most flavored nation in the entire game, they get so many things that allow them to do a different play style from Rome, which is more based on the land expansion and assimilation. Carthage, meanwhile, is mostly about finances and integration. At the start here, you see they are like almost Whoa, well, more than five times or about five times the size of Rome. It won't stay that way, and but that's also not including all the other things here that belong to Carthage. And they start out with way more pops. Rome will probably catch up. Even an AI Rome can easily take advantage of all of Rome's strengths. This is still a very strong, very good nation to play. And out of every other nation in the Mediterranean that starts close to Rome, this is the easiest one to compete with Rome as. The next one's going to be kind of a collection of nations. I'm just going to cover literally every single barbarian nation right now and to show you the blue here. This is Republic. Carthage is showing weird because we had them selected, but that's a Republic. The red is monarchy and all the green that you see. This is all barbarian and the barbarians play mostly the same. There are some differences. You have your normal settled tribes here. These are barbarians that have settled down. They're kind of the average barbarian. We went over those in the government guide. Federated tribes are more centralized versions of those. Very good if you're trying to play a barbarian that you want to turn into a republic or monarchy eventually. And migratory tribes up here. You can slightly tell the difference in shade of green here. You can see it better here. The slight difference in shade of green between settled and migratory. Migratory ones can literally pick everything up and move to some of these unsettled lands just at will, basically. It's a special ability that they have that they can do. Barbarians are hard to play, but they are small and very simple as well. So this can be new player friendly, but it's far more likely that you will just die very early on if you mess up, but it's simple. So we're gonna go over that. So there's a lot of barbarians here and I'm gonna focus up here in this region, Iberia, in Gaul, Britannia, Germania. We're gonna be looking at these regions. The barbarians that are out elsewhere, they have it harder because they're stuck in between all the superpowers on the map. Whereas these ones are pretty much out of the way. You might think, oh, but they're right next to Rome. Yes, but Rome likes to go where it gets claims, especially in AI Rome. And so Rome will go into Greece. They'll go into Carthage. They'll go for Anatolia and Egypt before they really start looking into Gaul. Before they look into Iberia, you'll have to worry about Carthage first. Britannia is just all the way over here by itself. And same thing with Germania. Britannia and Germania are probably the safest place to start as barbarians. The further south you go towards Carthage, honestly, the more in danger you are. Like I mentioned, this is a harder play style. You're going to fall behind in research. You're not going to be as strong. You won't be able to customize your military quite as you would be able to with a republic or a monarchy, but the options are there. Generally, I'm going to hone in on Arvinia, a federated tribe. You see, you start out very tiny, so it is very easy to manage. You have 85 pops at the start here with them. If we go look at, say, the, the Picts, the Picts who historically end up migrating north when the Huns come around, only 16 territories, 87, and Gaul is the more populated location for barbarians. If we go up here, you can see the Hibernians. If we go to Ivernia, two territories at five pops. And if we look at Brigantia, 
Or no, Iceni is a better one. Eight territories and 39 pops. You see the numbers we're working with are very, very tiny. You're not going to explode. You're not going to have a lot of events that will help you grow as any of these nations. This is just pure you versus the world. Very hardcore. But honestly, it can be very, very fun. I recommend Arvernia if you're trying to do one that's a little more grounded. You'll have a lot of ability to turn yourself into a republic or a monarchy later on because you're already federated. And that will put you a good step ahead of everybody else in Gaul. You'll be basically free to take over all of Gaul basically by yourself. Iberia is a different thing. If you start in the south, then you have to worry about Carthage sooner. And they will come for you once they're done cleaning up here if Rome doesn't get them first, which a lot of times they don't. Celts over here aren't too bad. The further north you go, the smaller they get, but the bigger the nation, the further north it is, the better opportunities you will have. You'll see that there is only Oritania here as a federated option if you're looking for a more grounded option because you want to advance from being a barbarian. This is really your only one here, just like you have Arvernia up here. And honestly, there's not a lot of federated tribes in the game at all. There is Gymnasia here, but this one is even in more danger from Carthage than Ortania would be. Iberia is probably the most dangerous place to start as a barbarian in Europe. Now, up here, you're making the choice between settled and migratory. Migratory tribes, these are all going to play pretty much the same. You will have the ability to get up and move if you want, but you start out in such a safe place anyway that you don't really need to. You could unify all of this and still stand no chance against a unified Gaul just because of how little population lives up in these places. You might see the number over there between all these nations. We're talking really small numbers, really simple, really decentralized playthrough and an opportunity to settle the lands around you very slowly. This is really chill. This might be a little low frequency you won't have a lot going on if you start up here, but you will get access to all those delicious migratory abilities. I've seen basically all of these nations do well. Herulia stands out as being in a pretty nice point. I've seen Frisia conquer everything. Semonia, Semnonia over here. And oh, and Syria too. These are all very well placed for actually taking everything over. But other than that, if you want help narrowing down, what you need to look at is the heritages. If you're picking a nation separate to your religion and your culture and whatever, you want to look at the heritage. Every nation has a different heritage. Some of them are generic, like forest heritage, but you see some of these have coastal heritage. Some of them, I just saw one, has rural heritage, and these provide different buffs. And so you could pick which one will fit your play style better because there are very few differences between these barbarians. And finally, looking at Britannia here, everybody is a settled tribe. You don't really get any other options here, as it would seem. If you want to start in Hibernia over here, then you have a lot of options, but they're all really tiny. We're talking everybody having roughly 10 or less population. The most populated nation in Hibernia is going to be the Brigantes right here. They, but they only start out with 11 and they're only starting out with two settlements, which is pretty standard for Hibernia. Just note, even if you unify all of Hibernia, Britannia is going to be way more powerful than you. And even if you unify all of Albion is what you can unify this into and form. Gaul will still be more powerful than you, but you will be safe here and easy to jump into Germania. Looking at who you can pick in Britannia, there are a lot of options. You see the Icenes are special. They have their own heritage. They are pretty important, I'd say, in terms of historical value. Brigantia is better set to actually conquer everything, but the Icenes are more unique, so you might want to check what they have to offer you with that heritage. Personally, if I tried playing this, I would probably want to try being the Iceni because they're the only really special ones anywhere over here. Everywhere else is pretty generic. Brigantes definitely does seem like the best choice potentially for conquering Hibernia. This is just a really easy place to start. You could be in Britannia or Hibernia pretty easily without ever running into heavy hitters like Rome or Carthage. So it's a very good place to learn being a barbarian if you are interested in a less tech heavy play style. 
that's simpler with smaller numbers, definitely. Germania, again, good as well, but you have less potential in Germania, and you can still reach Germania easy from Britannia. Going from Germania to Britannia would be harder because you have less population to raise bigger armies to actually pull such an invasion off. And... That's basically going to be all my barbarian recommendations and information. Just note, everybody that's in this region, Illyria especially, they're probably going to die. Can you make it work? Yes. If you're a new player, you're probably going to die. Uh, the further east you go over here too, you're probably going to die. Can you make it work? Probably, yes. But new players, you're probably going to die. And then everybody over here is just going to suffer, like all, everyone on the screen right now, is going to suffer from the fact that they are surrounded by heavy hitters that they stand no chance against. I wouldn't recommend playing any of the Barbarians, any of the Green Nations that you see on screen right now, unless you have a lot of experience with the game. Then you could probably pull something off, such as with Scythia, especially. India is kind of the same. Maria will just eat you alive. I wouldn't recommend it. Great, so that's Barbarians, Rome, and Carthage covered. Let's move on to some of the more interesting nations, such as the Hellenics. There's a lot of Hellenic nations here, but I'm going to start out with a new player series of recommendations that are going to be maybe not what you expected. So when you think of the Hellenic nations, you're going to be thinking of the heirs of Alexander, who start out in a big war at the beginning. We're talking Macedon, we're talking Thrace, we're talking the Antigonids, we're talking the Seleucids, we're talking Egypt, especially. There's potentially, you could think of like Parthia, Bactria, but they start out as satrapies of the Seleucids. They are not independent. Those are the main ones. Those are the heirs of Alexander. We'll get to those in a minute. They are very fun to play, but I'm going to make some new player recommendations and even advanced player recommendations you might not know about. In terms of Hellenics, if we actually go west of Rome here, there's a couple of options. Let's start with Massilia. You may know Massilia if you've played other games in this era. Massilia owns just this and this right here at the start. They are in a defensive alliance with the other two nations I want to draw your attention to, which right down here, I'm not going to try to say that now. Oh, maybe I should. Hemeroscopian, that. I'm sure that's wrong. And Emporian, that's much easier to say. These three nations right here are really well placed. If you want a Republic playstyle, very new player friendly, much more new player friendly than Barbarians are. And so they'll be easier than Barbarians in the short and long term, even given their placement. You start out very small, even smaller than Rome, as small as barbarians are starting up in Britannia in some of these cases, but you're still starting big enough to compete in your regional locations. Only Massilia has its own unique heritage here, so make sure to take a look at that to see if that is something that you like compared to the other ones who just have the Hellenistic heritage, which is notably different, notably different. I would definitely recommend Massilia over all else, and it's because they're the biggest of these three. They're the strongest of these three. They are surrounded by more valuable lands. And despite being super duper close to Rome, there's a couple things that happen there. You could ally Rome pretty early on. They'll drag you into their wars, but that would protect you. Because you're in Gaul, you don't have to worry about them until much later in the game. They're going to go east and south first. You could conquer Gaul before they get there. If you're already friends with them as well, they become a great power. They won't really attack you anyway. Rome can be a friend instead of a foe, as it usually is to every other nation in the game. This could allow you to conquer all these barbarian lands that are unsettled, and you can build cities in and build up, kind of like if you were playing a federated tribe, your goal might be. You have all this room to start from scratch and build up if you don't want to play with the well-established areas of Italia, of Greece, and etc. Massilia and these other ones are really good choices. Massilia is also the furthest away from Carthage, and with Rome as a friend, or even Carthage as a friend, because you're a republic, either one of them would befriend you if you wanted them to, you would be able to get a really good fun playthrough starting from scratch building up here. I definitely recommend looking at one of these three if you're a new player, and if you're an advanced player that's just kind of like missed these and not noticed them. Now looking over at the heirs of Alexander here, this is where things start to change quite a bit. Despite being Hellenic, they are monarchies, every single one of them. So this is a completely different play style from the Republics and the barbarians this is what you want to pick if you like stuff like crusader kings and character management there is in my opinion having played ck3 and 2 
more freedom in what you can do with your characters. There's no systems to discourage you from picking options and events and stuff that you want. This is more about managing a family, things like that. It has more room to min-max, I think, than any other government type and is probably the best long-term one. Every empire that you can form in the game becomes essentially a monarchy as well. This is probably, once you understand how to play the game, the highest potential government type, and that's what you're going to be working with here. There are a lot of options when you are picking an heir of Alexander, but this is where I want to mention everything I've talked about after Roman Carthage didn't really have any flavor. They don't have special events. It's really kind of bleh. But around this area is where we're starting to see a lot of those options again. As you can see, I have a lot of grayed out options here. Unfortunately, all the flavor of these options are only available if you buy DLC. However, don't let that discourage you from playing them. I've never owned the DLC, yet I've played basically all of these nations, and I can tell you they are very fun without having a couple of extra events. There are generic event lines that work just fine. Now, let's talk about them. So we have Macedon, Thrace, the Antigonids, Egypt, Seleucids. That's what we're going to hone in on right now. Antigonids, I would recommend you completely stray away from unless you are an advanced player. They start out as, technically, the most powerful of all of Alexander's heirs. However, at the very beginning, they can easily get embroiled in a massive war with all of the other heirs and completely fall apart if you are not careful, if you do not know how the event chains go already. If you are an advanced player looking for a challenge or masochistic, this is a very fun nation to play. Yes, but I would avoid it if you are a new player. That is what I will say about this one. They have very special events, very special heritage as well, and a very special starting situation that I would be very, very careful with. They have a ton of feudatory surrounding them. They own basically everybody around them, either in tributary or feudatory form. They're a chonker. They might even be the most powerful nation at the game at the start, but they're not the biggest. I'll get that across nice nice and immediately if we look for the biggest it's probably going to be the Seleucids here at the start yeah they have more pops they have more territories but i wouldn't describe them as being stronger at the start and part of that is due to culture and things like that the heirs of alexander have to deal with the fact that they were all led by macedonians which are these just little blue i guess it's blue it's dark blue purple colors that you see here sprinkled around so if you're anybody that's outside of Greece, you're not going to have a lot of Macedonians and you're going to be trying to keep minority populations in line. That means in terms of ease of playing culture, playing anyone that is not Macedon can be quite difficult if you don't know how to work around the pop system yet. The Seleucids are massive, as you can see. They are the absolute largest of Alexander's heir and very quickly after the beginning of the game can become the strongest of the... Alexander's heirs. However, they start out with their own problems, a potential war with the Antigonids, and they own Aracosia. Moria will be going to war with them, trying to get Aracosia from them. You could give Aracosia up, as well as some other things, and get a, a peace so that you can go westwards, or you can fight Moria over that, but risk a two-front war, or just completely say, all right, I'm just going to leave the Antigonids alone. They are huge. They are quite decadent at the beginning. By being so massive at the beginning, they don't yet have the technology required to actually keep all this population, keep their characters in line. There's a lot of penalties in this game when you get this big. And if you start this big early in the game, you don't have the techs that are designed to help you deal with all of that. So the Antigonids have this problem as well, but especially the Seleucids being the actual biggest centralized nation at the start of the game, you do have some pretty good vassals here like Bactris, Satrapies, basically the same thing as a feudatory. Parthia as well is a really useful one and Aracosia, very valuable as well if you're willing to fight for it. As all of Alexander's heirs as well, you get to benefit from the existence of road networks from the ancient world that do connect basically all of Alexander's empires that will benefit your growth of civilization and things like that as well. Final note on the Seleucids is just that I wouldn't recommend playing them if you're new. It's not quite as advanced as the Antigonids. You just need to know how pops work. You need to know how techs work before you can play these very easily. You need to know when and when not to expand. As a new player, I don't think you're going to know that. So I'd stay away from them until you get at least a decent amount of experience with the game. 
Egypt, meanwhile, I'd say this is probably the easiest of all of Alexander's heirs to play, not Macedon, despite them being in Greece and having all the Macedonians. So as Egypt at the beginning, you actually get to embrace the local religion pretty early on and your number one population that lives here natively is already integrated, I believe. You get the very rich Delta and the Nile that you can develop along as well as the useless deserts surrounding it which are easy to ignore. So it makes management very simple, especially road building pretty early on. You do start out with some satrapies such as Andros, this is in Greece, Kos, which is in Greece, actually Anatolia. And then this right here starts out as a client state that you can absorb as well. All of your neighbors suck, basically. You do have the Antigonids, but they'll start out in their big war. Definitely, if you're playing single player against Macedon, all their troops will be there. You'll be able to claim basically all of Jerusalem and then some if you go into that war early on. Cyrencia is just asking for you to take it over. This area right here protects you from Carthage. Carthage probably won't come after you, especially dealing with Rome. And then you have all this stuff further down the Nile that you can go into that's just filled with a bunch of weak barbarians, monarchies, undeveloped nations that are stuck. Remember I mentioned earlier, they're stuck and they can't do anything against you. You can conquer such easy nations, you get such easy ability to integrate and assimilate things, and you get such rich locations, abilities to make Alexandria's lighthouse. It is such a very good thing to play. Now, later on, being right here, you may have to worry about Rome and the Seleucids showing up as well. But the thing is that you have many defensible locations that you can work with instead. And you could try to put buffers there while you instead go into the weaker areas that you can take over and then just work like that. You have a lot of options as Egypt, more than any of Alexander's heirs, I would say, with far less challenge and an easier start being much smaller than the Antigonids and Seleucids. It's about like 100 territory steps. You lose about 100 going from Seleucids to Antigonids. Antigonids to Egypt, you lose about another 100. And it's just much easier to manage. You are much better placed. And even as a brand new player, I think you could do pretty well with Egypt. Out of all of Alexander's heirs, I'd say this is the most new player friendly one. Finally, Macedon, which is not the hardest of Alexander's heirs to play, but it's deceptively hard. It's deceptively hard. I've never seen anyone start playing Macedon that didn't get their asses beat at the very beginning. That's because despite being as strong as Rome at the start, basically a little bit stronger, but they will catch up to you and surpass you pretty quick. Macedon starts in a weird situation. They start with a legion that they can't afford, but levies, if you dismantle that legion, that could be stronger than Rome easily. They start surrounded by valuable stuff, but also some worthless barbarian stuff as well. They start with a Rome that will try to conquer them if they don't ally them, for sure, that they have to deal with. They are the first in Rome's sites out of all of Alexander's heirs. So it's, that's dangerous. But also, the Antigonids come after them in the very beginning, and they come after them for this city right here. As Macedon, you can give that away if you don't want to war with the Antigonids, but that means everything that is owned by the Antigonids around Greece and just them being there in general will continue to get in your way. If you do go in that war, you have to deal with the brunt of the Antigonids' forces while all the other heirs of Alexander just beat them up and take all their stuff from behind, you will be fighting for survival while Rome is getting stronger. It is a hard nation to play. It is definitely not simple. If I had to rate it overall, I would say it's harder to play than the Seleucids, but for different reasons. It's not because you need to understand mechanics, it's because you need to understand your starting situation and how to get out of it. The first time I played Macedon, I took the war with the Antigonids and I won and I came out pretty all right. The second time I did it, all these might be inverse, actually. I got my ass beat. It wasn't great. Every other person I've seen try this that's new gets their ass beat. And then the final time that I played, I went after Thrace instead and just let the Antigonids have their peace. And it actually worked out pretty darn well, I'd say. So I'd recommend looking at more of a strategy like that if you try the Macedonians. This is kind of mid-tier difficulty. I'd say it's harder than everything over here, definitely harder than Egypt. You start out very small, so you don't have to have the same problems as the Seleucids, the Antigonids. 
you do have all the Macedonians basically living here already. And you do start out also with the Thessalians here, of which there are many integrated, which will help give you an early game boost as well. Definitely a tricky nation to play. Now, there's a couple of notable mentions in Greece, such as Sparta and Athens. I know a lot of individuals that want to play Sparta and Athens, but this is not that era. We're talking about 304 BC, okay? The Sparta and Athens you want to play are probably 700 years before this. This Sparta has already been through the ringer and is very close to its historical being conquered. It doesn't really stand a chance as you might think of it, especially because everything else around it for the most part is conquered by a bigger nation. But those nations will be sent into turmoil. Sparta is probably the most playable option in Greece that is not Macedon. If you are looking for something playable, you could conquer this archipelago here pretty easily. And then going into Crete is definitely an option as well. This is kind of like a barbarian start where if you do fuck it up, you're probably going to fuck it up very early on. But you started at least very small. The problem is once you have this archipelago and Crete is kind of like, well, where do you go? You have Macedon to your north, potentially Rome coming in hot Egypt. You're surrounded. It's the most playable one. Athens is not really playable because it starts out as a feudatory of the Antigonids. It's not independent. This is not the true democracy Athens that you know. This is the Athens that was already conquered several times over and their true democracy was actually exchanged for a plutocracy historically, even if the government type doesn't reflect that. This would be plutocratic Athens that was like only 3,000 citizens were allowed to live in Athens. The rest were kicked out and only those 3,000 got a vote. That was instituted by Macedon, funny enough. But yeah, they're not independent. They're not really an option. There are mods that pull back the calendar if you are looking at playing stuff like that. But in the base game here, no, you're not really going to play Athens. So we've covered a lot of the map already and we're almost done, but I want to make sure you get the full list of nations to look at here. Looking at this region, I know I recommended against playing anybody over here, but naturally, if you do play anybody over here, these ones right here are the largest and easiest to play. Pontus, this is not the Pontus that you are thinking of. There's a Mithrandic event chain that can be started, I believe, from Paphlagonia here to form the Mithrandic Kingdom, and it would actually conquer this Pontus very easily. This Pontus is a barbarian state and the formable Pontus, the actual historical Pontus, the Mithrandic kingdom would be, I believe the monarchy that you can spawn in at Paphlagonia here. Additionally, notable mentions is if you do want to play around the Black Sea, which is not actually that bad of a place to play. It's far less deadly than being here and being here. You do have two standout options. I did briefly mention Scythia. If you want a barbarian, start over here. Scythia is a pretty good one. Chased out from their homes over here in the region of Scythia. They are pretty large and surrounded by stuff around them. They are a settled tribe, so they cannot migrate, but they are surrounded by individuals that they could definitely beat and take over. If you want to expand, Rome will kind of go this way and avoid you, as will just about everybody else. So this is probably the safest place to be a barbarian, just specifically right here in Scythia, than anywhere else. The Bosporan kingdoms are Hellenics, and they have their own special heritage as well. They are a monarchy, if you're looking to be a monarchy up here, and they are a really good option for playing a Hellenic in this region that is not surrounded by terrible things that they cannot deal with, not going to get thrown into turmoil early on due to the heirs of Alexander fucking around. These two are definitely very good options if you want to play Black Sea Nations. Like I mentioned, Paphlagonia, if you're looking at potentially making the Mithrandic Kingdom, I believe, it would be harder given your location, but it's an option. I'd suggest boss barns first if you're newer to the game, however. For the most part, like I recommended playing against any barbarian here, and that is true, but there is one nation to look at down here that is worth looking at, and that would be Kush. Historically, Kush ended up forming Egypt once. They were the 17th or 27th, one of those, dynasty of Egypt. They had conquered it one time. I forget if this is before or after that, but they have a special heritage. They stand no chance against Egypt at the start here. 
However, they have very defensible locations and Egypt starts out distracted and won't actually be going for them at the beginning. They are surrounded by weaklings otherwise that they can conquer, just like Egypt would benefit from, but this would be a little harder to do. You are a monarchy as well. Given that your entire nation is based around a little curvy single hallway of the Nile here at the start, that actually starts out decently developed, but can be further developed for sure. You have quite a lot of options available to you, funny enough. I already played Kush pretty in depth. I streamed it. Those stream archives are up on YouTube if you want to see them. And it worked out pretty well. Egypt was a bit of a tough nut to crack, but it is definitely doable. I wouldn't start this as your first nation. Wait until you have a little bit of experience playing a monarchy or just the game in general, military mechanics before you try this because just beating Egypt and then probably forming Egypt will be your biggest challenge. Once you do that, the world is open. It is a very challenging and fun nation to play though. I would definitely recommend this once you get past your initial stages. And now, in India, if you ask me, there is only one nation worth playing, and I believe that that is going to be the last one I mention here. There are others of note that I could mention, but we're already, like, gonna be an hour in, so. That's Moria. Moria has the potential to be one of the strongest nations in the game, but also has to live with a terrible debuff for a lot of the game. As Moria, you are taking over pre-India, basically at its peak. This guy that leads this is legendary in this history for forming basically the best nation that has ever been seen in this region of the world right here on the screen. You start out with the heritage of that leader, but you can lose it just after that leader dies. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind when you play this, because if you do lose it, then you're going to have a debuff in place of it the entire game. That's gonna make you very prone to civil wars to make your empire fall apart, because that's what happened to the Mauryan Empire after this guy died, just completely fell apart. Moria, however, starts in an area of the world that I've noticed a lot of individuals really underestimate. Do note that ancient civilization was literally based out of like right here. So yes, it expanded into Greece and Italia after, but it also was over here. And because of that, this place is actually pretty well developed. You have road systems, you have cities sprinkled about, and you have the only metropolis at the start of the game, if I can find, here it is. The only metropolis at the start of the game, in this game, having a metropolis, it's the biggest type of city I went over in the buildings tutorial. The more pops you can squeeze into a location, the more money research you can make out of a location. This is the most developed nation, sort of, in the entire game at the start. You have a very easy opportunity to get Arachosia from the Seleucids, putting them on the back foot. You are surrounded by easy to conquer enemies. These guys are completely trapped. If you play any of them, you can't get past Maria. Maria, despite being very easy to collapse, the AI gets a lot of bonuses that will stop it from ever truly collapsing, even on the easiest difficulty. So being Maria is the only real fun thing to do here because everybody else is just completely bottlenecked. They are pretty large, roughly as large as the Antigonids, so you do have to keep that decadence in mind when you try to expand. You get to form a very special nation if you conquer the Indian subcontinent. And you get to beat up the Seleucids, taking a lot of their stuff as well. Like taking Arachosia, basically at the very start you'll have the opportunity to do. Seleucids, as an AI, basically always give up Arachosia. This is a more advanced nation to play for sure. I'd put it at a similar difficulty level as the Seleucids though, just because of their special mechanics and the fact that they too technically are limited geographically going west because the Seleucids are in their way and they could just conquer this, but this would basically be, you'd be in your own little game here separate to everything else going on just because of how far away you are and due to the shape of the map being a diagonal hallway. And that is every noteworthy nation I wanted to mention. We have our new player friendly nations. We have our very in-depth ones. We have our not so in-depth ones. All the different government types of which Maria is a monarchy, by the way, at the start. We have all the reasons that I think you should play or avoid all of them. And like I mentioned, there are other ones worth mentioning that are smaller spread around the map. It's just, I want to cover 
all the ones that really would cover most players' gameplay of this game before they eventually quit it and moved on to whatever the next game would be. So, I hope this list has been helpful to you. I'm really scratching my brain trying to figure out what more tutorials and guides of this game should be. So if you have seen something that you want me to go further in on in a tutorial or a guide, I could make that. Just let me know in the comments below what you think a guide would be good on for this game, what you need help with. And if it's not big enough of a scope to be a guide, I can at least answer your comment and I can try to help you with anything that you are struggling with. But for now, that is going to be it for this video. So thank you guys very much for watching. Make sure to check out that playlist in the description if you want to see more guides. And I will see you, hopefully, on one of those videos.